Okay, so I've got a finished copy of my work up to this point. Again, it's never really finished, but we've decided that at this point we're at MVP, Minimum Viable Product. Our project is viable at this point. It is functional. Um, people can download it and use it. We can always add more to it, but that'll be for version 2. So I've got a copy of the project, and the first thing that I want to do is if you copied my project, I'm going to open up the project, and we need to edit that config.xml file. That is what defines my app, what differentiates my app from your app. Even though if 99% of the code is the same, that file is what differentiates my version from your version. So let's edit config.xml, edit in notepad. We haven't looked at this in a little while. No need to mention every single aspect of it again, but this is what will um, differenti differentiate my, my app and yours. I would like that whatever project you have up to this point now, I don't expect to give you copies of my project anymore. We still have more to work with it, but I really want it to be yours now. If you've got a copy of mine, it's got my color scheme and my fonts, yes. I do hope you take the time on your own to change the color scheme and the fonts and all of that. So if you did take my project, you probably want then your own unique ID here. So I will change that. Remember, you don't need a real website for this to work. You just need some differentiator. So I would recommend you put your last name there. version equals here. This is completely arbitrary, but we were putting a date. So we will put today's date, which is the 15th, 11.15. It's our version 1, subversion 1, sub, subversion with today's date. When we release the next version to the App Store, we can update that. Most likely for the next version, in a week or so, we will change this to something like 1.2. whatever the date in two weeks will be. You know, 20, whatever. So that scheme that we will use in a couple of weeks, you see the logic of it. It's not so much of a change that I'm going to change the, the large, that I'm going to increment the big version number. I mean, I would increment a subversion number. But for the moment, it's still our version 1 with today's date. This is the Android version code 1. This is the first version of the code we will be uploading to the app stores. When we add our extra functionality, we must increment that to a 2 eventually. And let's say three months later, we're going to upload a new version of it. That'll be version 3. Whatever this happens to be over here, I may have decided that we're already on version 2.1.2017, whatever. But it's the third version of the code we'll be sending up to the app stores. Uh, most likely, you'd also want to change line 5. This has just got some uh, generic information here about who the developer is. I have here JJ Apps LLC. You can change that to anything you want, a real company or not. You don't need to have like a real business license or a DBA or anything really, really official from the state uh, for you to be a developer. You're a developer if you give yourself a name here. That's all you really need. If you've got a website, you can put that in there. If you don't, you can just put example.com. Is anyone or does anyone own a, a real domain name at the moment? A couple of people? Okay, cool. So you can go off and get a domain name from a variety of companies, GoDaddy, Bluehost, Hostmonster, one and one. There's so many of them out there. If you need more info, I can help you out during the break. There's many providers out there where you can get your own little piece of the internet, your own domain name. And now with 25 years of websites, a lot of the dot-coms are taken. So if I wanted victor.com, it was probably taken 15 years ago, literally. But perhaps what is not taken yet is something like victor.guru. We have a .guru now. We have a .ninja. What else? We have a dot... I think I've seen .restaurant. We have so many of these dot something. .xyz is getting popular. 
So if the dot con is taken, perhaps there's still a dot something else. And uh, so you can get all of those from these providers, and um, they range in price. Oftentimes, if you buy some of their services, you get a free domain name for the first year. And normally, it's about 12 to $19 per year for a domain name. For our purposes, we don't really need one, so that'll work for me. And then an email. This can be a Gmail address, Hotmail, whatever. But if I have my own domain name, most likely I have the ability to create an email address um, that looks a little more professional, such as developer at campus.com. <clears throat> so those are the three things we need to change on this. The ID, the version, and the line 5. Save that config XML. Any questions on the config XML file? Save the config file and we can close it. Now what I want to do is look at my folder, my project folder, the WW folder. I'll take a quick look here if there are any files that I don't need. Oftentimes when we create these projects, we put stuff in the project folder that eventually we don't need. But here, everything we do, there's the pouch, the colors from Theme Roller, the various JavaScript libraries, our custom code, the index, the map. I already went into the map as well and connected the new color style sheet and the external CSS and JS files. Got the fonts folder. Um, I don't remember if I used both fonts in this project, but if I didn't, I would possibly think about removing the fonts that I wasn't using. So we'll check in a moment. If I wasn't using the arm wrestler font, I might want to remove those files because they take up about 282k, a quarter of a megabyte, and every little bit helps. Over on the images, it's still got the Cordova icon in there. We're not really using it, and it's 53k. Um, I don't expect to use it. That was just a placeholder, so I will delete it. It'll save up a little bit of effort and space. So when we compile it, it's even smaller. These other graphics, like the org image we did use, and the logo there, the loader. These images come from jQuery Mobile, so we definitely need them. I suppose if you do still want to save a little bit of space, you would go in and remove the ones that we never used, but they're less than one kilobyte each. So I wouldn't. But if we're trying to cut, if we're trying to trim the fat for everything, that might be something to do. What I want to confirm is in my kodika.css file. Okay, so I did set it up for both fonts. Yeah, so I in my case I am using both fonts, both font families, arm wrestler and anagram. I'm using them here, and I'm using them down in actual selectors. So I will keep those fonts. So browsing through my CSS file. There doesn't seem to be any code that I left there for no reason. At the very end there, there is this portrait style and landscape style. We've locked our project to portrait, so we don't really need the landscape rule, the media query that detects when we go landscape. So that's a few bytes of data that we don't really need. Same thing with the portrait one. It's already locked to portrait, so all of that code there is for portrait orientation. I personally don't see myself making the app landscape ready, I always want it to be portrait. So I think these last few lines are extraneous, so I deleted them. 
Remember, there's always a, going to be a copy of my code in the network folder or on GitHub, so you can always come back to that. I'm going to clean that up a bit. What I also want to do at the very end is add a comment block. I'll do the multi-line comment. We will have name. Project date description. Let me add one more version. This is optional, but if you're going to share your work collaboratively or if you're going to or open source it or whatever, maybe you give yourself a little credit. So here I would just put this info for real or not, but again, we're going to end up with our with this app at the real app store. Jumping a little bit ahead you can decide if this app that we've worked on, you really want to put it on a real app store or not. I would recommend you do go through the whole process that I'm going to show you to really put the apps in a real app store to have you know your friends and family really download it. Although it's our class project, you will be able to remove it from the app store so it's no longer available. However, if the person, if a person downloaded it to your device, depending on which app store you're on you're at you won't be able to remove it from the user's device so just be aware that if you do go through the whole process you will have an app on a real app store that people can download so here I just put some information who created this maybe an email there what's this project the unofficial well the project is my SDCE version 1. Dot 1.2016.11.15, today's date. You can write the date however you want. I like to write it in the format of year, month, date. You know, I grew up, of course, doing it as 11, 15, 16, but now this sort of date scheme is a little more computer friendly, which is very useful organization and so forth. Sorting, not that one. And description is the unofficial San Diego continuing education app. I'm going to copy that block of code because I'm going to add that to my other files as well, the JavaScript file and the HTML file in a moment. just some sort of comment block that gives yourself some credit. I'm going to save that. Then I'll open the Kodika.js file. We had a lot of console output that was useful for us as we were beta test or alpha testing it and such. You can decide to leave that or not. Oftentimes for me, the, at a certain point, the console output has served its purpose and it's just cluttering up my console. So you can either comment it out or delete it to save the space. So looking at all of the areas where we've got console output, I'm curious how many we have. In my case, there's about 25 times I've got console output. Starting from the top, I see uh, Cordova is ready. We don't need that. That was line 8. Handle the Cordova pause and resume events. I think by now we know what these event handlers do right here. We never did anything with them but it's kind of self-explanatory what they do, so I'll remove that line. Bunch of output here, got name, okay, data. What did that do? That was a function, prompt, enter name, okay. So that was when we asked the user to customize the app, lines 18 and 19. 
some output there for testing. I don't need it. We have some other consoles for other things. No name. Um, in this case, I might leave those if I'm going to further test this. These wouldn't really happen anyway unless I'm testing the project. I haven't figured out all aspects of it perhaps, so I'll leave those. User cancelled on line 20. I'm going to delete that one. Nothing really happens there for the user, so I'll remove that. extra spaces there to clean that up. Where I've got the show name, um, this is when we were setting up, is there a name already defined or not? If there's no name, give ourselves some output. Well, we know what that does. I'm going to remove that. Line 70 or so, I've got the console output that just is confirming to myself that PouchDB works. We've, been, we've seen that it works as long as we've got the library. I'm going to take that out. Line 96, I'm just showing that JSON object. Um, we know it works, not necessary. db.put, result of putting it. I don't need that. I've tested that enough to know that it works. Line 107 and 112, that's where we used to have our old alerts, our basic alerts that definitely we don't need since we've got the, the better jQuery mobile pop-ups. So I've got those alerts, I'll remove those. There's a console on the default switch. I might leave that. Line 131 has an output that shows our results of rows. That's definitely one I don't need because that one was when we were testing it to see the data that we're pulling out of the database. That was raw, raw data, which then gets passed over to the show classes table. I've got a couple more spots where I upgraded the, the basic alert to some pop-ups. So at about 172, 179, the results of deleting, I got an alert for an error and another alert for an error. I'll remove those. Further down on uh, this one is updating a class. I've got 
Very redundant console log. Yes, updated. We don't need that. That's just confirming to ourselves that we've managed to update the, the record. Leaving those outputs for errors often are useful for testing, but then these to show results of a positive result, I think those just clutter up the console. We know they work up to this point, so I'll delete that because we have that pop up anyway. Deleting the database function nuke. If we had an error, good. If we have a result, who cares? So there's another one where I'll uh, remove that result because it works. We gave ourselves a note here that eventually we might want to do a jQuery mobile pop-up um, if the user canceled. Okay, I'll leave that there. That might be something to do further later. We've got a default switch condition, which we probably won't even ever get to that one, but it's a good practice to have a default condition. Um, so I'll leave those. And then that gets down to on pause and on resume, which we never did anything with, but those are to set up if we pause the app and return to the app, so I'll leave those. One minor little thing is that the, the, the default taco project had built in on device ready, which we've used extensively, and it had on pause and on resume. And it used the syntax of putting a semicolon at the end of a curly brace. And most of the time nowadays, you don't really need to put a semicolon when you're defining a function. So it's obviously worked this whole time. But when we've been making our own functions, and as I've been teaching you, I never put in a final, curly, a final semicolon for the final curly brace of a function. It's somewhat optional to do it or not, but oftentimes from what I read in the documentations, they're, they often say, don't put a semicolon there. So I'm going to remove the semicolons that define the on device ready and the on pause and on resume. It's three bytes. But keeping my code consistent is one of my goals, personally. I want my code to be readable and consistent and look nice because I may not be the only one looking at my code, especially me that I do give my code away off on GitHub. I want it to look nice for people. So that would be something that I would do. Got some bunch of empty spaces at the bottom there you may want to remove. And the comment block that I wrote in the CSS, I can copy that as is and paste it into the JS file because the JavaScript also accepts the multi-line comments. So I think uh, everything's good on the JS file. If we really wanted to be fully complete, I might want to go at some point to add these comments to my code. We did that extensively with Pouch. We commented all of our code, which is very useful. Um, that should compress pretty well for production ready. But we never quite did it for the other parts of the project. You can do that on your own. Or if you fully want to also, you know, optimize what you've got, you, know, you could remove your comments, although that's kind of like um, detrimental to you, I would say, because if you want to go back to your code later on, what did this code do? I don't have it all memorized all the time, so leaving myself comments like this, I think, is valuable. The JS file, I think, is good. Lastly, we will look at the index HTML file. We've got that comment that explains the CSP. That's fine. Browsing around, do I see any green comments that stand out that I may need it to remove?
I think for the index, everything that's there should be there. Although I guess seeing over here on line 240 in the computers section, we had left ourselves a grid, a four, a, a two column, two row grid if we wanted to put something there. Over on the computers section. It's down here, invisible. It's not really taking up any space at all visually. It's taking up a few bytes of space. You may never really use it. It's just extra clutter, perhaps. I'm going to say I don't plan on adding any extra graphics or content down there in a grid, so I'm going to remove that. And I can put it back relatively easy if I did need it. So I'll say let's remove that. At about line 240, I'm going to re remove this div block of this grid that we never used not really planning to use it. So everyone's project looks exactly the same as mine. Like I said, I filled in some of the text, like in the About screen and so forth. All of that's complete. If you'd like to make one more final change to some of these elements, you definitely could, like maybe the copyright down there. I'm using my apps.biz but I guess I'll keep it consistent with what I wrote in the XML file. I, what did I call mine? I called mine Victor's Apps. I'll put copyright Victor's Apps or whatever yours is from your config file. Although you need to change it for every one of the screens and that would be one, two, three. Three changes. So find and replace will work really well here. If you select what you want to change and hit Control H, which is up from Search, Replace, Control H, I'm going to replace my apps.biz with Victor's Apps. And it's often safer to activate match whole word and match case because I may have a generic word that I'm trying to replace with a specific word. If I'm trying to replace apps with Victor's apps, that would be too much. It would replace every instance of wherever apps appears, even if it's in the middle of a word. So if elsewhere I had written my apps, it would change my apps to my Victor's apps. That'd be weird. So it's often better to activate match case and match whole word can also test it that you're not going to replace too much by first under find counting the items you're going to replace. If you click count here, it's going to replace it three times. In my case, it, it would do exactly what I wanted. But in other cases where the word is too generic, and you go to count, it might, and it's going to say you're going to replace 17 times. Well, that's too many times. If you then fine tune it, that often gives you better results. And then I'll replace all. Notice what's cool here also is if you select some of the text first and then activate in the selection, replace all, that will further hone in on what you're trying to change. And I'll do replace all and replace it with some other fake company name. So then I have a new name of a company. I don't think there are any other sort of bits of detritus hanging around, so I think the HTML file is fine. If there's anything that I forgot, let me know. But I'm going to add that comment block, although remember it's HTML, so the comment block delineator is different. And I think technically we should add it before the end of the HTML. We'll write the HTML comment block. Remember it's a different kind of comment tag. 
I'm going to use the HTML comment tag, opening and closing. Oh, and lastly is the map. Um, we'll look at the map.html file. This one, oh, there's a little stray C here, I guess, line 10. And in this case also, I've commented out the content security policy because it's, it's much too strict for the map. It's blocking pretty much the full functionality of the map. So what we would want to do is go research from at that link. We would need to test out the map, look at the console, and it's going to tell you this is what you need, this is what's missing in the CSP. And it is pretty involved because it's going to say you're missing this library and you're missing to declare these graphics and it's a little bit complex. So I'm just commenting it out. Besides that, we have a variety of comments that explain what's going on. That's good. And then we've got a, uh, the original link there. So you can decide here if you want to also put a sort of like a credit to where this project originally came from. And I want to put the same comment block in the same place. I think that takes care of everything, and out of curiosity, my index file is 364 lines, my map is 140 lines, the JavaScript is 276, and the CSS is 113. I made it up to 893 lines of code in this project with all of the different files. You know, it's a small project. So 893 lines. And I guess if we count the config file as well, that's another 102 lines. Although we didn't touch most of those lines. So we're getting really close to a thousand lines of code for this project. There's still much more we could do with it, of course. There will be more that we will do. We'll add a few more, a couple dozen lines for version 2. But all my items here then are I did a, a, a this is a pre-flight check. I've gone in and just done another quick look at all my files, the code itself, what's in the folders. The point of that is that if you can shave off those little pieces, those few bytes, kilobytes here and there to make your app smaller so it can compress smaller, um, that's better. If you've got code that doesn't do anything that was you know, to do, but you never did it, maybe remove it, save a copy of it elsewhere, keep your app lean. At this point, the WW folder is 1.29 megabytes, size on disk. I always forget the difference between that, but I think Windows counts megabytes different or something. And the whole project itself is... That's pretty big. Well, it's 33 megs or 119 megs on disk. Just making some notes here. Because then we're going to compress it down, and you're going to see that this big project compresses really small, actually. It should be less than 5 megabytes, probably around 1 megabyte when it's done. More complex projects with more graphics and such, of course, take up more space. So that's something to think about, that we have this ability to make all these great apps, but eventually they're going to get installed by the user. And especially when we make games and we don't compress our assets properly, well, you're going to have a really big file that the user needs to install. 
So any questions on this pre-flight before we actually then compile it for real? Okay, let's take a look at the handout. I gave you one more new handout in the network folder, handout 8. Uh, 